Hi, this is Evan Lewis again in New Zealand, and uh, I'm back to talk about uh, my projects with the Boxford lathe. I just recently found out it's a 1955 model, uh, found the serial number hidden underneath the tailstock on the, on the lathe bed. And um, I've talked before about some problems with backlash and uh, a previous um, episode. Uh, this is, by the way, episode number five in, in season four, and that would have been episode three that I talked about making a top hat adapter, which is very useful for reducing backlash problems. But today I'm going to really bite the bullet and talk about actually replacing the um, nut that goes inside the cross slide. Um, looks like a fairly simple sort of job to turn up this little thing and cut a thread inside the middle. But it is an internal thread and that makes a problem because you can't see what's going on inside. And as I'll explain in a minute, it's a non-standard thread too. Um, and uh, it turns out to be a lot more complicated than it sounds um, and quite difficult to turn. And one of the biggest issues, of course, is that the thread you're trying to fit it to is part of the lathe and you have to dismantle the lathe every time you want to check whether the nut fits. So it's a long, laborious process. So let's get started. Well, today's the day we're going to do an internal, non-standard Acme thread. It's a 7 16th inch diameter and it should be 12 thread brush, but because they wanted to make the dial turn a tenth of an inch for each turn, they made it 10 threads brunch, which is non standard. It's also a left hand thread, so I'm going to have to put the tool right through to the back of the work and advance outwards instead of the opposite way around that we normally do threading. So here's the cross slide, and I uh, actually had to make this new handle for it. The original one was damaged, so I made this up out of stainless steel. And it's worked very well, it's very comfortable to use. And it goes on the end here, and it has a special little nut on the end, which uh, you really need to screw up with a notch in the middle to take that out. But I haven't got one, but I usually manage to get it out. There's a um, grub screw in here to take out, and there's a grub screw in the, um, in the micrometer dial, which holds it in place. You can change the position by undoing this, this grub screw, but in doing so, you alter the, the uh, backlash in here that uh, if you leave that loose like that you, that'll cause backlash you have to push this as tight as you can up against this base and screw it up and I usually do that by putting a screwdriver behind it like so and just pushing it forwards while I do up the grub screw so the second thing to do was to get this section out now the more the newer uh, boxwood lathes had a boss around the base in here and two screws you just had to take the screws out and slip this thing out and you're done, supposedly. Um, this one's different, it's older. And it turned out that it has a grub screw in here. And I had a devil's own job getting that uh, grub screw out. Um, I've got a big selection of Allen keys here, uh, both metric and imperial. And the only one I could get to fit was a 2mm, which doesn't make sense. This is an imperial lathe. Um, so, uh, but a 2mm worked. Got that grub screw out. Still couldn't get this thing out. So I looked underneath and found underneath here, directly opposite this one, is another grub screw exactly the same and equally difficult to get out, or worse actually because of the position it's in. Eventually managed to get that out and then couldn't slide this out. Uh, ended up having to get a block of wood behind here and hammering it out. Um, before getting to that stage actually you would unwind the lead screw all the way and wind it back and back and back until it comes right off its thread and you can lift this piece out. And this is the culprit, the nut that we want to replace. Uh, and it sits in here and uh, of course this thread runs through it. It's a left hand thread. I found that this piece where the grub screw um, connects in, there was a, a burr on there and that's why it wouldn't, I couldn't get it out. But I finally hammered it out and, and filed that burr off. Okay. So we get the thread out and recheck the diameter of this thing because there's been some question about what size it is. 0.4435 inches. Oops. And these calibers will tell you what fraction of an inch that is. And sure enough, 57128s, which is actually a little bigger, I guess 128 bigger than 7 sixteenths. So it's basically uh, similar to a 7 sixteenths. Acme left-hand thread, but um, made a few thousandths bigger, and I discovered the reason for that is that the um, specifications for an Acme thread include the internal diameter thread being uh, two to four percent bigger 
within the specified diameter to, to, allow, to allow some clearance. Well, in this case, I want minimum possible clearance so that you don't get any backlash. So they've compensated by making this thread slightly bigger than 7 16 uh, The reason why they would go for 10 threads per inch is because they want it to advance by a tenth of an inch for each turn of the dial and they subdivide this into a hundred divisions and then you've got your thousandth of an inch on your micrometer reading. So it has to be 10 threads per inch. Um, there's another question too, that is a standard Acme thread has an ang slight angle on the sides of the of the uh, grooves, total of 29 degrees from one angle to the other. It's uh, Enoch's engineering, Alan, uh, put this uh, thread on an overhead projector and measured that angle of 17.5 degrees. So I don't know whether that's a measurement error or whether it truly is that much non-standard, uh, but the difference is his was a metric lathe and it's possible that with metric threads uh, they use some other kind of standard or non-standard approach. Okay, so I think I'll end up assuming this is uh, an angle of 14.5, 10 threads per inch, just over 7 16th inch. Now, some more sophisticated lathes have a cross nut that's split in the middle and you, by squeezing it together you can make it uh, take up slack. It would be very nice to have that. And um, <clears throat> Gary on the uh, Boxwood Users Group has actually done that, made a, uh, an adjustable nut. And I'll look into that possibility as well. So I think that brings us pretty much up to date. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Oh, by the way, we've got the, um, there's a, um, a little piece of metal in here, which is the Gibbs adjustment. And when you tighten up these screws on the side, it pushes this plate against the dovetail and allows you to make it a really firm, uh, tight fit on the dovetail by making it adjustable. And these, each of these um, Allen keys here, are one of these grub screws really, um, they've got lock nuts on them so they don't accidentally come undone. And what you do when you're assembling it is tighten them up until there's a little too high and back, tighten and back off a fraction of a turn and then lock it in and do the same with each nut. Well, I've got this thing apart. I should show you actually how this um, Gibbs plate sits in here. Uh, I don't know whether you can see, but there's a little peg right there right in the middle of this side. There's not one on the other side because this is the only side that has the, um, the plate in it. And it goes in there and you have to make sure that that peg goes into the little little groove that's in the in the gib plate. I'm going to have to make a, a boring bar with a special Bluetooth in it. <laughs> Cut to an angle of 14 and a half degrees on each side and flat on the end just like the, the thread. Um, and have it mounted on the end of a very small boring bar, which I'll have to make. So, have to make so let's take a closer look at this thread. Apparently one of the problems with trying to look at this with a photograph or an overhead projector is that the helix of the thread actually causes a slight angle on the side walls that makes it difficult to really measure it accurately. And an alternative method which uh, came up on the Boxwood Resource Group, I think it was uh, Terry Dixon suggested this, is to get some quick setting plastic putty and press it firmly into the thread uh, and then cut it in half after it's set or grind it off and then you can see the true cross-section of the thread and may be able to me measure the angle more precisely. Another method that I came up with was to use trigonometry. If you can measure accurately the width of the top of the thread, which you can see quite clearly here, and you could measure that with a pair of calipers, you know that the pitch is a tenth of an inch. The difference between the two will give you the width of the side walls, and so with trigonometry you can calculate the angle from the, the depth of the thread and the width of the walls. But I decided it was 14 and a half degrees and I was just going to do that. So the next thing was to make this tool. I found it a bit simpler than I expected to cut the angles on here with the help of a thread gauge. Of course the gauge had to come from China and they have degrees and 29 degrees included which is nice. And I just held this gauge in my hand alongside the grinder and just did it by eye. Uh, and I was fairly satisfied with the results. And had to make the uh, boring bar shaft as well, uh, just from a piece of mild steel, which is plated. And drilled a hole in the end, drilled and tapped it so that I could put in a grub screw in the end. And that held the uh, tool in place. The hole for the tool, I just drilled a round hole and then filed it out to a little square to fit a very small uh, lathe tool, high-speed steel. 
the process of actually cutting the thread involved taking the lead screw out of the cross slide repeatedly uh, in and out and so this process was repeated over and over again. The nut was removed by using the hexagon, there's a hexagonal grub screw in the top of the nut. This is all, all this does actually is hold it in place, it doesn't do anything additional. Uh, apparently the later models had a split down the middle of this nut and a tapered end on the grub screw which as you tighten it up would spread the threads apart and uh, make it adjustable. But mine was just a simple plain thread and the grub screw did have a taper on the end but it pressed on this pin which is also tapered and pushes the pin out sideways and makes it lock into the casting and that's what holds it in place. And that peg is supposed to face the operator according to one online expert and uh, I don't know why that is so he said that was something you could figure out for yourself. I thought I'd be able to get away with just making this a um, tapered end or, rather than making a fancy curve but uh, when I look closely at the channel it runs in, it actually rubs on the channel and I guess that just keeps it in alignment well. So that's part of the deal and uh, it was necessary to file it back into a, uh, a semicircular shape. Otherwise the machining of uh, this part was pretty straightforward stuff and I uh, won't dwell on that. I don't know why I didn't record this at the time uh, and it is something you'll find in other places online but uh, I thought I should explain how I lined up the center punch mark on the nut. First, of course, I marked out where I wanted the hole to be in relation to the, the top of the nut uh, and made a punch mark. Then I put a live center in the tailstock and had a dead center as well. They're usually drilled with a center hole at the back end of the dead center. And that is located onto the live center in the tailstock, while the tip of this floating center is place in the punch mark you've just made. As you turn the chuck around you'll find that the uh, floating center swivels around. Then you put a dial gauge on that floating center and measure how far out of alignment it is. You'll see it swing back and forth and if it's swinging by 26 for example you would then need to move it back 13 in the appropriate direction using the dial gauge. And once you've done that you're almost spot on. Um, maybe take one or two attempts to get it just uh, just perfect 